All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started, everyone. Good afternoon, I'm Amy Gorin, I'm the director of INCHIP, and I welcome you all to this critically important talk today by Dr. Rhea Boyd. I appreciate that during this incredibly busy semester, uh, we've had over 100 people sign up to attend today's talk. And I wanna thank each of you for committing some time today to learn about best practices in publishing on racial health inequities. At the end of the presentation today, we're going to have some time for discussion, and that's going to be moderated by Nana Marfo, who's a doctoral student in our clinical psychology program. And I also want to thank our co-sponsor for this event, UConn's Health Disparities Institute. And I'm going to turn things over now to Dr. Wisdom Powell, who's the director of HCI, who's going to introduce Dr. Boyd. Boyd, thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank all of you for coming to this critically important uh, presentation. It really is my esteemed privilege to introduce Dr. Rhea Boyd. Dr. Boyd is a pediatrician, public health advocate, and scholar who writes and teaches on the relationship between structural racism, inequity, and health, with a particular focus on the child and public health impacts of harmful policing practices and policies. Currently, she serves as the Chief Medical Officer of San Diego 211, working with navigators to address social needs of San Diegans impacted by chronic illness and poverty. And she also serves as a director of equity and justice for the California Children's Trust, an initiative to advance mental health access to children and youth across California. Dr. Boyd graduated cum laude with a BA in Africana Studies and Health from the University of Notre Dame. She earned a medical degree at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine and completed her pediatric residency at University of California, San Francisco, also where I completed my postdoctoral fellowship. In 2017, Dr. Boyd graduated from the Commonwealth Fund, a Mongan Minority Health Policy Fellowship at Harvard's University School of Public Health, where she earned an MPH. Her recently published article is just exceptional and it appears in health affairs and in this article she outlines a new standard for publishing on racial health inequities a framework that she will share with us today i invite you all to listen uh, with intentionality and with an open heart and mind and i welcome you dr boyd uh, to, to speak with us today thank you again for giving so generously of your time and your scholarship Thank you so much, Dr. Paul, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you, Dr. Gorn, for inviting me. Um, on this first slide, I shared um, my Twitter handle. If folks want to reach out to me after the presentation or if you have questions we don't have time to get to, um, please reach out. I'm on Twitter probably more than I should be. Um, today, we're going to talk about the bar that we have set in our field to publish on racial health inequities. And we're gonna talk about how that bar is exceedingly low. We're specifically gonna highlight the ways that racism is what creates racial health inequities and what we can do um, within our health services research to better identify that link. I don't have any disclosures. So let's jump in. The core of what we're talking about today is the, rate, is the relationship between structural racism and our bodies. When we're talking about that relationship, I think the words of ta Coates are just so pertinent. As he said in his book, Between the World and Me, but all our phrasing, race relations, racial chasm, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy, serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience. It dislodges brains, blocks airways, rips muscle, extracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. We must never look away from this. We must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the regressions, all land with great violence upon the body. Or as my co-authors in Health Affairs said, racism remains a bloodying force in our society and it structures every facet of our lives. There are three main mechanisms by which researchers commonly suggest that racism may um, impact our physiology. One of those mechanisms is called toxic stress. 
it refers to cumulative exposures to adversity, often the adversity that happens in early childhood between when a child zero and five years old. Um, and exposures to adversity during that period of life is known to have physiologic and intergenerational consequences on a person's health and the health of their future generations. And racism is one of those exposures to adversity, and we'll cover um, a bit later why that is. The other is allostatic load. Allostatic load refers to the ways that adversity can cumulatively over time also create wear and strain on our, um, on our um, organ systems, and that that cumulative effect can actually shift our adaptive responses leading to disease. So responses that used to be useful, like the flight or flight response that's driven by our HPA access, can actually be maladaptive or dysregulated to lead to early disease and potentially even early death. The other is weathering, which is a concept that was introduced by researcher Arlene Geronimus that covers the fact that exposures to chronic discrimination and other forms of racism and adversity can shrink the ends of our DNA or our telomeres, and by virtue of that shrinking, actually contribute to early aging of our cells and their silent death, which can be um, a triggering event for disease, organ system-based disease, but also for early death. Ultimately, when we're looking at those mechanisms, the question that we're asking ourselves is what's the relationship between our cells that make up our body and all of the structuring forces that shape our communities? And how does the interaction between our cells and our communities ultimately translate into our intergenerational health, into our health as individuals, but also the health of our children and our children's children? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to model for you how we should talk about racism in healthcare, and I'm going to use the existing syndemic our country is facing, the pandemic and police violence. In that modeling, I want you to listen to how I talk about racism as a driver for racial health inequities. And we'll close by talking about some of the items our article hit on um, in health affairs to specifically hone our focus in research to shift to talk about racism similar to the ways I'm going to do today. So when we think about the syndemic that we're facing, the underlying root of that syndemic is vast inequality in our society. And that inequality is only growing over time. And my home state of California leads the way. In the United States right now, the top 1% of earners holds more wealth than the bottom 80%. That is partly because wage stagnation is profound in this country. If you compare the hourly earnings for non-supervisory employees, folks who work but are not the boss, they're making essentially the same that they did last year in 1973. As a result, the purchasing power of our workforce has barely budged in half a century. And so the reality is we are all a part of a generation for whom only half of our children will out earn their parents. And we know intergenerational economic mobility is profoundly shaped by race and gender in this country. This is data by researcher Raj Chetty, who used to be here at Stanford, but is now um, at Harvard with his Opportunity Insights Labs. And what he shows, if you look at the green and yellow map on the right, is that it essentially pays to be a little white boy who grows up to be a white man in the United States, because no matter where he lives, he is likely to earn more in adulthood than his parents did when he was a child. Conversely, if you look at the red and orange map, what it shows is that there's nowhere safe to be a little black boy who grows up to be a black man in the United States, because no matter where he lives, he is likely to earn less in adulthood than his parents did when he was a child. As Chetty and colleagues summarized, in 99% of neighborhoods across the country, black boys will earn less in adulthood than white boys, despite growing up in remarkably similar families. And this is what's really striking about his data. These are two little boys who both have two parents in their homes. They both, both of their households have comparable incomes. It's not the racial wage gap. They have comparable levels of education. It's not the racial achievement gap. They have comparable levels of wealth. It's not just the racial wealth gap. And they live on the same city block and go to the exact same school. It's not just residential segregation, which is a major driver of racial health inequities in our country. So what is it? 
What they found is that intergenerational economic mobility gaps are the smallest in areas of the country where there's low racial bias among whites, where white folks are less racist, and where there's high father presence in black neighborhoods. This isn't father presence in your home. This is father presence on your city block. And so we have to ask ourselves, what's the relationship between white folks' racism and father presence in black neighborhoods? That question then calls us to probe even casual forms of white racism, or what the root journalist Michael Harriet calls white collar crime, C-A-L-L-E-R. When white folks call the police on black folks simply for existing in public, it may invite intimidation, harassment, violence, or arrest into the life of that individual, and that's often what's captured in the media. But what we sometimes miss is what it invites for the entire community, and particularly the kids who live there. If that interaction results in the death, prolonged injury and hospitalization, or incarceration of a Black father in that community, such that it extracts that father from that community, it also shapes the intergenerational economic mobility for the children who live there as well. And so when we talk about the pandemic, this is the pre-existing inequality that was already rife throughout the country before the pandemic broached our shores. And if you overlay current spots of COVID outbreaks, you see that it aligns closely to areas where there is wide gaps in economic intergenerational mobility by race and gender. As a result, we have all witnessed that Black, Latinx, and Asian subpopulations, particularly Pacific Islanders, have the highest rates and risks of hospitalization and death related to COVID. This is data from Kaiser's Family Foundation that looked at 50 million EPIC patients. What we also see though, is as a pediatrician, I have to highlight that those racial health inequities are not just present for adults. We are absolutely seeing them for children. This is looking at rates of hospitalization by race and ethnicity. It's from the CDC's uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. And what we see is that upwards of 75% of young people who have COVID-19 as the reason for their hospitalization are either Black or Latinx. We also see that deaths from COVID among young people, again, those less than 21, who we as a society have said are overall less affected, which is true. But when you look at the racial health inequities, it's alarming, even for deaths of our young people, for whom Latinx and Black populations make up 74% of COVID deaths. If we look over time at how we as a nation are doing, from April, when these racial health inequities just started to emerge, to just a few weeks ago, we see that they're actually widening over time. The mortality rate related to COVID is widening between racial groups over time. As we'll note from this chart, the top line there is Black Americans who have overall the highest COVID mortality rate. It's about 3.2 times the rate of white Americans. The second highest mortality rate group is indigenous populations. This is particularly true for Choctaw Nation in Mississippi and for Navajo Nation in Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. Those are all states in which indigenous populations have the highest COVID mortality rate. That third line, that light blue line, is Pacific Islanders. And I again just want to highlight them because I think often in our national conversation about COVID, we've lost the impact on certain Asian subpopulations like Pacific Islanders. So when we see those gaps, we have to ask ourselves, are they evidence of simple disparities or just differences in health outcomes? Or are they evidence of inequities, which are population level differences in health outcomes that are completely preventable? And because they're preventable, they're unjust. So today we're going to explore the extent to which the inequities we've seen emerging amid the pandemic are actually inequities, as I'm referring to them, and we should refer to them in that way as well. So where do health inequities come from? Health inequities arise when certain populations are made vulnerable. And I put that in red and bold to remind us, no racial group is innately, biologically, or genetically more vulnerable to COVID-19 than any other. Folks are not made vulnerable. And that happens through the inequitable distribution of protections to keep folks from being sick and the inequitable distribution of supports to treat sickness and ameliorate all of the adverse health consequences that accompany being sick, um, like the economic toll we've seen accompanying COVID-19. 
And so when we talk about COVID-19, still as um, public health advocates and as a healthcare infrastructure, these are the primary risk factors we highlight. We say folks are at risk for complications of COVID-19 if you have, quote, underlying illness like heart disease or diabetes, if you have advanced age, or if you live in an impoverished area. But what we don't talk about is how segregation profoundly shapes the racial distribution of heart disease in our country, or how chronic exposures to discrimination increase rates of hypertension within communities of color, particularly Black American communities, or how environmental racism shapes who's exposed to pollutants and literally determines who breathes clean, fresh air and who breathes in toxins, which also then shapes who has asthma in our um, neighborhoods or how the racial wealth gap profoundly concentrates poverty within communities of color, or how toxic stress or exposures to adversity can over time cumulatively create wear and tear on our organ systems that then weather our cells, such that one cellular age could be advanced of your chronological age and you suffer complications and early death from illnesses at much younger ages than expected. These are all examples of how structural racism has profoundly shaped who has COVID in this country. It does that because humans use racism to provide differential access to good services and opportunities by racial group. To use the words of uh, pediatrician Kamara Jones, inherited disadvantage, not just inherited disease, is what's absolutely driving the racial inequities we've seen during this pandemic. And so this is all examples of how the physical and structural, the legal, the policy, and the cultural environment in which we're all growing, learning, working, and playing shapes not only our health, but the health of our kids and our kids' kids. I'm going to give you one example of that because while it's important for us in our research and in our analysis to name racism as a cause of racial health inequities, it's critical that we name the mechanism by which racism is operating. So let's give one example. During the pandemic, we could use the example of hand washing. So we know that hand washing is probably the simplest, the oldest, and the cheapest way to limit exposure and spread of infectious disease. And yet race, not income, is the single greatest predictor of who has access to clean water in this country. Black and Latinx populations are twice as likely to lack access to clean water in their homes as white households. And indigenous populations are 19 times as likely to lack access to clean water in their homes as white households. In this case, structural racism is operating through residential segregation and then public divestment within indigenous, Latinx, and black communities, which then excludes them from access to one of the most simple forms of prevention in the middle of a pandemic. And so understanding who has access to clean water then helps us understand who's most at risk for COVID-19. So when we talk about the inequitable risk of COVID infection and complications, and I've got a star by risk just to remind us that we're thinking at the population level where systematic factors are driving outcomes for groups, not at the individual level where an individual's choices might shape their health outcomes. At the population level, what drives the risk for COVID can't simply be summarized as poverty, or underlying illness. Instead, it reveals legacies and current practices of racial exclusion, discrimination, disinvestment, and violence that concentrates disadvantage within communities of color, creates adversity for children of color, and shapes population level opportunities to be well, and provides the perfect conditions for folks who live in communities of color to be sick. These are the factors why all cause mortality is increasing in this country, and it's primarily driven by the um, alarmingly high all-cause mortality of non-Hispanic Black populations, um, which is that yellow line, non-Hispanic Indigenous populations, the gray line on top, but also from non-Hispanic white folks. As a result of our increasing mortality, life expectancy is decreasing in our country, which is really an aberration among the wealthy world, but especially in a country like ours that spends more on healthcare than any other. And so even in the midst of COVID-19, when this um, infectious disease has now become the third leading cause of death, white mortality is still likely to be less than what Black Americans experienced every year pre-COVID-19. This is a chart from the New York Times that adapted research from researcher Elizabeth Wrigley Field. And what it shows is 
the alarming jump in white mortality from the pandemic, which is that dotted line. But then you can see the huge chasm between that jump and what black folks have experienced at baseline. It's important to note that it's not even plotted on this chart what black folks mortality is as a result of the pandemic, which is likely above that line, or what indigenous mortality is pre or post pandemic, which is also likely above this line. This is why Elizabeth Wrigley Field said racial inequality is as deadly as COVID-19. Because right now, in the middle of the most deadly pandemic our country has seen in a century, white life expectancy will remain higher than black life expectancy has ever been. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are those legacies and practices of exclusion, discrimination, disinvestment, and violence that leads to those enormous gaps in mortality that are driven by gaps in disease incidence among populations by race and ethnicity? When we think about that legacy, we often go back to this time, to the Jim Crow South and segregated public accommodations like bus depots or water fountains like in this picture. But we don't as often go back to this time. This is a picture from Newark, New Jersey in 1967 in what is now known as the Long Hot Summer of 1967. Historians call it the Long Hot Summer because during that summer, there were 159 race massacres across the United States, all sparked by an event of police violence against a black taxi driver in New York, New Jersey. What we don't talk about when we talk about the uneven burden of disease facing racial and ethnic populations is the contributions of state sanctioned violence and how those contributions begin so early in folks' lives. We don't talk about what it's like to be this little black boy walking down your own city block with your government at your back, that's the National Guard, with their guns drawn and your hands are up because you know you're not safe. We don't talk about what it's like to be these black women who line that sidewalk, whose hands are also up, who are not intervening because they also aren't safe. Or what it's like to be that little black boy on the left side of this photo who's looking back at a boy who's just a bit older than he is and he's understanding something specific about what it means to be black and a boy in this country. And we don't talk about how little has changed. This is a Pulitzer Prize winning photo that covered Time Magazine in 2015 by photographer Devin Allen that asked that question, how much has changed since 1967? This was after police in Baltimore murdered Freddie Gray. And we continue to ask that question in 2020 after multiple publicly um, acknowledged police murders. And so when we talk about the forces that are shaping who has COVID-19, we absolutely have to talk about police violence. Because remember, I started that piece in Health Affairs with my colleagues talking about the trees in the South, right? Talking about strange fruit. And so I'm just gonna read these first lines of this poem that was then popularized by Billie Holiday um, so that we understand what we're up against. What Abel Maripol said was, Southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root, black bodies swinging, in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees, right? Racism is that, is that root that creates these inequities, and we have to talk about it in that way. And we have to talk about the way that those inequities then overlap, intersect, and compound each other. As we said, racism is that bloodying force that's structuring every aspect of our lives. And so we're gonna briefly talk about police violence so you understand how to talk about the intersections. So what we know about police violence is about a thousand people are killed by police every year in this country. And it's a particularly deadly exposure for black men and boys of whom a thousand will be killed by, one in a thousand will be killed by police in their lifetime, which is also the mortality rate of measles. When you think about the near constant public health surveillance and investment we placed in eradicating measles, and you compare it to the relative little to nothing. We as health services researchers, as our public health infrastructure, as clinicians like myself have done to eradicate police violence as a deadly exposure for black men and boys, but folks of color in general. We see the ways that racism not only shapes deadly exposures in this country, but it also manifests as our own inaction in response. We also have to talk when we're talking about police violence as folks whose immigration status shapes their exposure to policing. 
For kids in particular, we know that kids who witness or experience an immigration-related arrest of their family member, they have higher rates of depressive symptoms, and those symptoms are magnified if both of their parents have undocumented legal status. We also know that police violence is a form of community violence. This is data from researcher Ali Silwell, who told us that when folks live in what she calls lethally surveilled neighborhoods, in neighborhoods in which police murder a civilian, in those neighborhoods, the other residents of that neighborhood, particularly women in that community, have higher rates of hypertension and obesity. Her study also found that they have higher rates of asthma and diabetes, but the association wasn't as strong as for hypertension and obesity. Think back again to those underlying illnesses we are saying drives your risk for COVID complications and early death. Once you know that exposure to lethally surveilled neighborhoods also drives those illnesses, then part of our public health approach to eradicate the racially inequitable distribution of COVID-19 has to also be to address police violence. And for some kids, they don't even have to be exposed to police for it to affect their health. It may manifest in their lives as caregiver absence if their caregiver is incarcerated, hospitalized, or um, killed as a result of that encounter, or a custody transition, or as we saw in that photo from Newark, the criminalization of their peers. And that's what links even routine police encounters to ones that either in quantity or severity can affect kids' health into adulthood. And so the violence of policing ultimately separates children from the social networks on which they rely and in which they thrive. And the violence of racism and the many structural inequalities racism creates at a population level impairs and disappears caregivers. That's why racism is a devastating root of chronic undertreated disease and completely preventable premature death, because it's that absence of caregivers that drives the core forms of adversity that then contribute to toxic stress, allostatic load, and then weathering. In short, racism kills people. Racism kills babies. And as a pediatrician, I have to say this because I think often when we think of who racism harms, I think we typically picture adults. Racism kills babies. This is a devastating study from the Proceeding with National Academy of Sciences that just came out in September that looked at 1.8 million hospital births in Florida between 1992 and 2015. And what they found is that if you match the race between the newborn baby and their physician for black babies, it narrows their mortality gaps. In Florida, the mortality gap between black babies and white babies was three times as high. Black babies were three times as likely to die in that first year of life than white babies. And what they found is that if black babies were cared for by black neonatologists or pediatricians, it narrowed that mortality gap by half. And it was particularly true for babies that were sicker and in hospitals that delivered more black babies which is a sign of segregation, that hospitals that care for more black infants actually do worse. You see similar studies, um, you see this evidence similarly in the maternal mortality literature. Hospitals that care for more black mothers actually do worse, which is a sign of segregation and its impact on healthcare outcomes through healthcare quality. Racism also kills healthy kids. I think sometimes when we imagine how racism works, we say, well, racism probably just compounds risks that populations are already facing. Untrue. Racism kills completely healthy children. This is a study from August of this year that looked at almost 180,000 apparently healthy children and compared their surgical outcomes between racial groups. And what they found is that Black children had almost a three and a half times the odds of dying within 30 days after a surgery compared to um, their age match white peers. They also had higher odds of post-op complications and serious adverse events. So it's important that we understand that racism harms folks across their life course. That starts even with babies and healthy folks, and that the effects of racism can be both acute, it can start immediately, like within 30 days of a surgery, for example, or chronic, as we often think about racism's impact on resource distribution, which then shapes health outcomes. And so if we're going to respond at scale to racism as a public health crisis that it really is, we have to be able to name it as healthcare services researchers. We have to be able to identify the mechanism by which it's operating, and then we have to propose ways that it can be eliminated.
This is really the thrust of that health affairs piece. And so if we're talking about naming racism, we are doing a poor job. Um, this is a systematic review in 2018 um, by Rachel Hardiman and colleagues that looked at our public health literature from 2002 to 2015 and found that only 25 articles actually named institutionalized racism, either in the title or the abstract, among all articles published in the public health literature and in 50 of the highest impact journals. And then if you drill down a bit deeper, what they found is that institutionalized racism was only a core concept, meaning it actually shaped the, the authors then proposed how it shaped their outcomes in 16 of the 25 articles, right? This is like a decade span with only 16 articles that help us understand as public health advocates how we can actually address institutionalized racism as a cause of racial health inequities. Obviously, over the last nine months of this pandemic, uh, a number of articles have come out in prominent high impact journals seeking to name racism. But this is really a more recent phenomenon and not one that um, is common in our field. After we name racism, then we have to identify how it works. Again, turning to the words of Rachel Hardiman, who just published an incredible article um, in Health Services Research uh, in, uh, earlier this month um, that looked at how um, racism is considered in the field. What she said is that an interpretation of findings have to begin with the public health critical race praxis tenet that's referred to. Um, the critical race praxis tenet that's referred to as primacy of racialization, which is the idea that our tendency is to attribute the effects, to attribute effects that are studied to race rather than to racialization or to racism. And so unfortunately, common and accepted approaches to our research have failed to give us the language we need to talk about race as a product of racism and racial inequity, or to give us the process we need to actually eliminate and address racism and its outcome, which is racial inequity. Without that language, to understand racial inequity as a product of racism, we in the clinical sciences have developed a collective and deep aversion to confronting whiteness. So here again, I'm gonna to turn to the words of Dr. Hardiman, who helped us understand that current analytical methods reflect white racial framing that's just rife in society in two fundamental ways. One, we as researchers often incorrectly present racial categories as immutable biological fact when we fail to acknowledge that racism, not race, causes observed health disparities. This one is critical because often people say, well, what about papers that didn't actually have that really terrible sentence that perhaps these findings are due to biological differences or genetic differences between racial groups? Like, are those papers fine if you just delete that sentence? And the answer is no, because if you actually don't interrogate racism as a cause, the implicit assumption is that racial categories are capturing biologically dissimilar populations which is just blatantly untrue. Two, researchers replicate society's white, su white supremacist hierarchy when whites are used as the dominant group to which we compare other populations or when we normalize, and I added this language because I think it's also true, it also happens when we normalize white patients' behavioral choices and we say that their better health outcomes or their relative improved health is because they make better choices than other populations. So too often in our research, despite the fact that whiteness is shaping everyone's access to power and resources and rights in society, it is treated as normative and rendered invisible. And so we're gonna make it visible for us so that we can talk about it in our discussion today. So what is whiteness? First, it's different than white. White is a racial status that's based on a person's perceived skin tone. Whiteness, however, is the structural apparatus which confers certain privileges and advantages to white folks based on their perceived racial identity. It does that through laws and norms that empower, normalize, favor, and reward white people as a population. To describe how whiteness works, I use this um, image here of someone getting a boost over a wall. 
I use it because often when I present about whiteness, folks say to me, well, what about the individual hardships certain white folks face, like poor people in Appalachia, for example? This is to illustrate the fact that whiteness can be the boost that individual white folks need above their hardship to still um, gain certain privileges and advantages. I'll give you an example. We know when compared to white populations, black populations have less wealth at every level of income. Similarly, when compared to white populations, black populations have less opportunities for employment at every level of education. Those are examples of how whiteness is the boost that some white folks need above their income level or their education level to garner the advantage of having wealth and employment in ways that other racial groups are excluded from. And so when health services research treats those structural advantages and privileges that are given to white folks as a population as individualized, innate behavioral characteristics, or as consequences of somebody's genetic inheritance. Then our research works to render whiteness invisible and to render the ways that whiteness shapes access to life-affirming and health-sustaining resources in society invisible. And so we're gonna talk specifically about the ways you should make whiteness more visible. So we're gonna go through four forms of racial exclusion and discrimination that whiteness operates through. The first is white hegemony, which establishes and enforces racial hierarchies in which white people nearly exclusively hold decision-making power. Most of our healthcare infrastructure is a white hegemony. The folks who have decision-making power tend to be white folks, both in our hospital system, 91% of US hospital CEOs are white, but also within our research system. The vast majority of folks who are granted an NIH um, K award are white folks as well. Um, the next form of racial exclusion and discrimination that whiteness um, is built around is white supremacy, which creates and maintains a racial ordering of humans and resources that reinforces the racial dominance of whites. White supremacy usually functions through either violence or through abject deprivation to demonstrate the fact that white folks are dominant. It subjugates other folks so that white folks appear to be the dominant group. White privilege is a form of racial exclusion and discrimination that preferences white folks through disproportionate access to resources associated with mobility. And we covered some of the mobility literature. And white normativity refers to forms of racial exclusion and discrimination that naturalizes power asymmetries between white and non-white people as being primarily meritocratic. This is where we attribute the fact that white folks have better outcomes to the fact that they are doing something different that is also better than other groups, which again, is just untrue. And when we ignore how whiteness impacts the health of communities of color, we also miss how whiteness harms the health of white folks. This is a book um, by Jonathan Metzl, a psychiatrist at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine that in full disclosure, I reviewed for The Lancet in January of this year. But the argument Dr. Metzl posits in this book is compelling and one that we have to take up as a field. Essentially, what he says is that whiteness can harm the health of white folks in two ways. One, when white folks invest in their own whiteness by trying to exclude other racial and ethnic groups from equal access to rights and resources, it actually works to shrink the pot of resources available to everybody. It particularly does that when folks try to use the political process to exclude other groups from resources. When you shrink the pot of resources available to everybody, that leads to everybody's worse off health in the end. The second way is that sometimes whiteness actually increases white folks' proximity to lethal tools. He, in the book, refers to guns as one example and white folks need to um, kind of champion the Second Amendment and the relationship between the NRA and white supremacy. But I think we see another example emerging amid the pandemic. When we saw early in the pandemic, white folks take to state house lawns often armed with semi-automatic weapons, decrying the need to um, adhere to public health advisements, we also see white folks asking for their whiteness or trying to demonstrate their whiteness as the privilege that enables them to not have to adhere to the guidelines that everyone else has to. 
But those privileges obviously place them more at risk the same way in a pandemic, it places everyone at risk. If you don't want to mask or don't want to safely distance or shift how your business is open to allow folks to stay safe. And so when we as a field render whiteness invisible, we not only miss the ways that it harms Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and folks of color, but also the ways that it harms white people too. And in the middle of this pandemic, we cannot look away from that because although we have highlighted in this presentation the racially disparate and inequitable effect of COVID on the lives of folks of color, we cannot miss the fact that the vast majority of humans who have been lost as a result of this pandemic are white folks, whether we're looking in May or whether we're looking in August. And this is data that just came out of the CDC's report a week ago, right? White folks have died from this pandemic. And if we don't have a racial analysis that allows us to talk about the racialization of white people and how whiteness can engender structural racism at a population level that also harms white people, we do white folks a disservice as well. And so if we're not identifying how racism works, we often tend to backslide into patient blame. This is pretty common and accepted. And one of the manifestations of that is that we tend to then hone in on patient mistrust as a driver of racial health inequities. We say, well, the reason, just on a call just this morning, before I jumped on this call, um, I'm gonna be on a panel about colorectal um, cancer and the racial inequities. Just this morning, somebody said, what we really should talk about is the patient mistrust that drives inequities in colorectal cancer. And I had to stop them short and say, we are going to talk about mistrust in a very specific way because too often it is used as a tacit way to blame patients for their own outcomes. This is a quote from the paper that I just wanna read because I think we captured it well here. While patient trust obviously shapes healthcare use behaviors and is an important part of the patient-physician relationship, Incessant racial health inequities across nearly every major health index is not really revealing to us what patients have failed to feel. It is revealing to us what our systems have failed to do. So to be clear, patient trust will never solve racial health inequities or narrow gaps in health outcomes by race. And when our research is particularly attuned to focus on individuals rather than systems, it makes us unable to then, um, to then say specifically how systems have harmed individuals, how systems have utilized, maintained, or benefited from racism in ways that harm individuals. And so part of the um, shifting of our focus away from patient mistrust is to instead focus on the ways our systems drive that mistrust, because that's what actually has to be changed. If patients just magically trust systems, but systems don't actually function any differently, more patients will actually be harmed. And in many ways, mistrust, particularly among Black patients and our Black American community, as a result of their own experimentation and exploitation in the healthcare system, that mistrust is actually a structural analysis of how our systems have failed to treat them equitably. And so what do we do about that? The first thing I wanna say is that what we do about that is not just talk about our values as it relates to diversity. I think in the middle of this pandemic and what's been happening around police violence, particularly the most publicized cases, some have taken to public statements about what diversity means to them. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if your department or institution has made similar statements. This is one from uh, Wells Fargo CEO on June 1st of this year, when he was quoted in CNBC alongside five other um, bank CEOs, highlighting what he called the tragic death, what I would call the unjust murder of George Floyd, the senseless killing of Ahmaud Arbery, the quote, as he says, wave of bias against many in the Asian American community. As he called it, this is a painful time for our nation, as a white man, as much as I can try to understand what others are feeling, I know that I cannot really appreciate and understand what people of color experience and the impacts of discriminatory behaviors others must live with. So as a CEO of Wells Fargo, I can commit that 
We will do all we can to support our diverse communities and foster a company culture that deeply values and respects diversity and inclusion. But it must just be said plain out that valuing difference and valuing diversity is not an anecdote to racism. It does nothing to address the ways that racism is embedded in our work, in our institutions, and in our society at large. As an example of that, literally weeks later after he said that, he was then quoted in a company memo saying, while it might sound like an excuse, the unfortunate reality is that there's a very limited pool of black talent to recruit from. You know, one day you're saying we value diversity, the next day you're blaming the populations you've historically excluded for their own exclusion. I think we do the same thing in healthcare. We say we value diversity, and we often, when we say we value diversity, again, don't center that diversity around the racial and ethnic exclusion of certain populations from our field. And then we say, you know, we value diversity, but we don't translate that actually into how we want to address racism as the reason why we don't have diversity in our field. And so anti-racism is where we must go as a field, to use the words of Abolitionist and scholar Angela Davis, in a racist society, which the United States is, it's not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. Because again, institutionalized, institutionalized racism often functions through inaction. And we went through that example of what inaction looks like in regards to police violence. And so anti-racism, these are the words of E.G. Omoloyu, who wrote, So You Want to Talk About Race, Anti-racism then requires that we, as researchers and clinicians, do more than simply be passive within systems that harm other people, or do more than simply highlight the disparities or inequities that exist. We have to actually target them specifically. But that process is getting more difficult, just to be totally transparent. This is an executive order that was passed by the current administration on September 22nd that basically said that it uh, individuals or, uh, excuse me, institutions that receive federal funding or have federal contracts or are run by the federal government can no longer um, participate in anti-racism and, honestly, anti-sexism training. So while we talk about the importance um, of putting racism within our uh, analytic approach to racial health inequities, we also have to be um, mindful of the ways that that work is actively under threat. It's not just simply that some folks have forgotten to do this. It is that some folks um, are invested in maintaining the fact that we don't do this. Finally, confronting whites, whiteness has to be an anecdote to racism as well. At the end of that long, hot summer of 1967, Lyndon B. Johnson, the president at the time, um, put together a commission uh, the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders to ask why there were so many race massacres across the United States. The commission became known as the Kerner Commission, named after the then governor of Illinois, and it was made up of 10 members, eight of whom were white men. And the conclusion of the commission, I just want to share because I think it sounds remarkably similar to the moment we're in now. As they said, this is our basic conclusion. Our nation is moving toward two separate societies, one black, one white, separate, and unequal. This deepening racial division is not inevitable. The movement apart can be reversed. Choice is still possible. But I put an asterisk here because that predominantly white male panel back in 1967 told us exactly where the root of these problems are. As they said, what white Americans have never fully understood, but what black Americans can never forget is that white society is deeply implicated in the material conditions that contribute to death and disease in this country. White institutions created those material conditions. White institutions maintain those material conditions. And white society condones the health inequities that emerge as a result. And so ultimately, we all, but particularly white researchers, white leaders, have to move to abolish racism from every institution, every practice, every policy, and every social norm in which it operates and too often hides. The future health and well-being of our kids and our kids' kids will absolutely be measured by how well we succeed in this. And if anyone wants to take a quick approach to anti-racism, voting is absolutely the best way to do that. Although sometimes this presentation can seem like it lacks hope, I absolutely think hope is our superpower in the words of Brian Stevenson, the director of the Equal Justice Initiative. As he says, we can't let anybody or anything make us hopeless. Hope is the enemy of injustice. Hope is what will get us 
to vote and to shift how we look at our own research and how our own actions contribute to racism in society, even when that's increasingly made more difficult. So thank you for having me. I'm just gonna open it now for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyd. That was incredible. Um, just to put one word to it. Um, we're gonna start with the Q&A now. Uh, for anyone who has questions, you can feel free, free to use the chat function, or if you would like to ask your question um, vocally, please use the raise hand function in the participants panel, and I will go through there as I see them and allow you to ask your questions. I'll just get started. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, really excellent and, and making me think about a lot of different things, which I, I really greatly appreciate. One of the questions I have is just how do we get NIH and other funders who often sort of steer research uh, priorities and, and where people go with their research? How do we get NIH to, to you know, push us in the directions that we need to go in. What efforts can we make with funders to appreciate the importance of, of looking at race differently in our studies? I think that's a great question. Um, and part of what's good about it is, is it looks, it's a structural question. It's about why um, is certain research prioritized and funded over other research? Um, I think one role there is for folks who work at the level of the NIH to actually shift what they fund and to prioritize both different researchers. At the end of Dr. Hardiman's study looking at, um, you know, examining racism in health services research, she highlights the need for more Black researchers in particular, that more Black researchers need to be supported, um, particularly because Black researchers have championed critical race practice. Um, so I think part of that will live at the level of the NIH. I think the other part of that lives at the level of researchers who apply to the NIH. I think if you know your research is not um, examining racism, if you are particularly looking at racial health inequities and you have not examined the ways that racism works and named the mechanisms by which it works, and you're not seeking to look at um, how we then might address it, like, don't submit that. Like, I think part of it is our own responsibility to raise our own bar, to know how good is good enough. And it's part of why we wrote the health affairs piece to say, like, internally, just between us, like, let's raise the bar. And um, I hope that folks would do that. I hope that folks that review proposals for the NIH would do that. I hope the NIH has some kind of task force trying to do that. But really, it has to happen at every level, as from folks who submit grants to folks who review those grants to the NIH people who make the RFPs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. We have a question from Dr. Kim Gans. She asks, what are some concrete actions that white researchers can take to work towards ending systemic racism? And she also added, big question, I know. <laughs> it is a big question, but a good one. And I'm glad you asked it because I'm trying to probe that towards the end by returning to the words of the Kerner Commission. Um, I think the end of the health affairs piece gives some concrete suggestions for folks, particularly as it relates to like publications. So for white folks who are um, editors of journals, who are reviewers for journals, and for us as lay readers, um, what white folks can do in that capacity. I think the other important thing is to think both about our role as researchers and about who we are in society, which is also why I ended with both. I think while what we do in research absolutely shapes the health interventions we roll out as a field. I think what's more powerful is the ways that we contribute to and participate in maintaining white supremacy and the rest of society, because what's happening within healthcare is really just a reflection of what lives in the rest of our society. And so questioning your own choices, where you live, if you contribute to residential segregation or gentrification, where you send your kids to school, if you contribute to school segregation, 
how you vote. Do you vote only in your perceived interest as um, a white person, or do you vote within the interests of populations that um, may diverge from your own or may look different than your own? Um, I think thinking outside of our individual roles is part of the work to address systemic racism because it lives, the systemic part is that it lives outside our individual role. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Christiane Eason. She asked, are you aware of any organizations looking to fund or grants that specifically target issues related to social determinants of health? Yes, so many. I would say um, so, so many. I'm on a listserv called Public Health Awakened that posts RFPs like that, um, in addition to other ways that folks in the public health world can get more involved to address social determinants of health. It's called Public Health Awakened. It's um, maybe, oh, I can't because I'm sharing my screen, but I was going to share a link to it, but it's by Human Impact Partners, which is an, a national organization that does health impact assessments of policies. It's a great listserv. So for folks who are looking to just stay apprised of um, positions and RFPs, I think Public Health Awakened is a good research, a good um, listserv. Wonderful. Um, next question is from Dr. Lanika Black and Carr. She asked, in our respective health research areas, what variables in addition to race or in place of it may we want to measure to understand the mechanisms of how racism works? That's really great. I think um, the first question is, I think you, and maybe I should preface this by saying, um, although I write and teach about the impacts of race on racism on health, I um, am not a health researcher in the same way that many of you are. So I think one of the ways that I would suggest is to reframe what your questions are. So instead of just thinking about your same research and whether or not you're going to use race as a variable or not, think about the underlying assumptions that are driving the connections that you're interested in studying, and then try to get to the base of what that connection might be. I think that will take us further from the research that just describes uh, racial health inequities to the research that helps us better understand how we can actually address it. So um, I, I say that to say I don't necessarily think it's just a question of kind of do we use race as a variable or do we just add additional variables. It's actually like a reframing of the fundamental questions that we're asking and then trying to get to and examine the underlying assumptions embedded in those questions. Um, like, are we asking a question that then might say that it's one group's behavior versus another group, or is a way that we can actually interrogate how systems lead to resource inequities that then result in racial health inequities? Um, so maybe that would be an approach I would consider. In the health affairs piece, we also link to a whole article that's just on using race as a variable. Thank you. Um, we have a few more questions in the chat, but I noticed that uh, Adriana Sell has had her hand raised for a while. So Adriana, please go ahead. Hello. Um, thank you, Dr. Boyd, for such an inspiring and like affirming um, presentation. I really enjoyed it. I'm a sociomedical medical science major at UConn. And my question is, how can we use your um, framework for publishing on race and racism um, to push policy and policy change um, on a greater level? Is it the role of health researchers um, to ensure, like, to push policies to help create um, racial justice in this form? Brilliant question, Adriana. It absolutely is. And I'm so glad you said that so that I don't leave today without saying that. The reason that we need to formulate our research in this way where we interrogate racism is because that is intervenable. It's useful to policy solutions. And at the end of the analysis of papers that are framed that way, researchers should suggest some of those policy solutions so they can directly be used. As somebody who kind of works at that intersection of clinical service delivery, but also policy development, I can tell you that 
you sit in rooms with powerful people who then literally pull out a paper and say, this is what they suggested we do. Like people are looking to the literature. They want it to be quote unquote evidence-based, which is a topic for another time about how that also reinforces racism in our field. But it gives you enormous power as a researcher if you write on this field to actually shape policy solutions. So don't shy away from suggesting the policy implications of what you're saying because it has policy implications whether you acknowledge them or not. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question from Dr. Sherry Pagato. He said, informative and inspiring talk. What advice do you have for clinical trialists for, for building trustworthiness with Black, Indigenous, people of color communities? That is a hard one. I would say that is a hard one, and a lot of people might answer it in a different way. I'll answer it this way. I don't work to build trustworthiness. I work to identify areas in which I participate in systems that harm other people and to correct those harms. The natural outcome of that approach is that people will um, perceive their care as higher quality and better because we're not hurting them um, and that then they will have more trust in the system as a result. But I don't think just aiming to increase trustworthiness as the start of or your endeavor or your work is the is the most effective or like right framing for it. I think we really have to become researchers who really investigate like where do systems create harm and how do those harms compound or intersect such that certain populations are rendered more vulnerable than others. And when you're doing trials there is so much data that is known by the public about how folks have been harmed. And so it's ensuring that that doesn't happen anymore. And once that reliably doesn't happen anymore, folks will naturally have more trust. Thank you. I'm seeing uh, we have about five more questions. Do you have time for those, Dr. Bill? Oh, I do. Okay, wonderful. So next we have, um, I think it's, Sorry if I butcher your name, uh, Le Lieber Lester, um, with the question, in what ways do you think anti-racism can be applied in real time rather than through ideas of gradualism? Mm. Agreed. So I think incrementalism is a tool of white supremacy to say like, it's almost like PDSA cycles, honestly, to say like identify one problem and then try to like micro make changes, hoping you make changes that happen on the systems level. I think it, it might not be as effective and it might be destined to fail. So I think thinking more specifically about anti-racism is really useful, which is as a frame, it just says you have to actively be addressing forms of racism. To do that, you have to have, identified where racism is working in your institution, in your study, in your department, um, and the, the mechanism by which it's working. So I think it's, it's a process to say, I think racism is at work here. This is the mechanism by which I think racism is working. And then instead of just ignoring that or thinking that stating that is sufficient, like here is a process to actually then address those mechanisms. I think that is the right approach. And it often won't lead to gradualism. It'll lead to like the entire way we look at this is perhaps the problem. Great, thank you. Next question is from Devarshana Ghosh, um, who also has a question in the chat. If you'd like to ask your question, please. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm going to start my video as well. Oh, uh, hi. That was a great talk. And um, my question was related to a prior question about how do we measure uh, uh, beyond just the absence and presence of race to actual racism and discrimination? And um, around that, how do we encourage, motivate the different sources of the data sometimes which are bound to? We, we have, we just can't collect all possible data and do everything from scratch. So national surveys, local health departments or other that uh, you have 
collect detailed and nuanced data around race, which helps our researchers who really wants to move from just the absence and presence of race categories to actual racism and the way you described in the uh, presentation today. Thank you. I think um, a couple of things. I think one, we tend to preference certain types of data and certain types of information in health sciences research. Um, and we call those types of data objective. And I think we have to question the ways that there's a level of subjectivity to all of the, the quote unquote data or information we use to draw inferences and ask ourselves why certain, why certain forms are less well respected than others and try to, um, try to honor and include those other forms of data in our work. Uh, the ones that I'm referring to particularly are like qualitative methods that might actually rely upon narratives or storytelling, which typically is, um, you know, debased as anecdotes as if it can't be representative. Um, when for police violence, for example, it is those anecdotes that was the only evidence we had for so long of how police were harming black folks, because it's not mandated, including right now, that that data is collected in most states or at the federal level. So I think one, trying to include other data sources that preference the voices of, the, of those most affected by the outcome that you're studying, I think is, um, is a helpful way perhaps to start. Thank you. Okay, and um, I think we're going to pause there. Um, if anyone had any remaining questions, Dr. Boyd did provide her Twitter information. Um, feel free to reach out to her that way. And thank you all for coming. And thank you again, Dr. Boyd, for a wonderful presentation. Of course. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, yeah, reach out. I could share more papers if folks are more interested in this topic. Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, if you share the papers with us, we'll make sure to get them to everyone who is in attendance today. Um, just thanks again for joining us and so glad you could join us from California and uh, share your important work. Thank, thank you so much.